Hi everyone, welcome back to the Grape Explorer. In this series of videos, we are taking an in-depth look at WSCT Level 2. This is part three, so don't forget to check out the other parts in this series. If you're new to this channel, welcome. I'm the Grape Explorer. On this channel, I do wine education, product reviews, and lots of wine tastings. So if you're interested in wine, consider subscribing. This is part three, and part three is all about learning outcome number three. And there is an awful lot to unpack here because learning outcome three is all about understanding the environmental influences, the grape growing options, the wine making and bottle aging influences, and the style and quality of wines made from the principal grape varieties. So there is a lot to unpack here because when you're dealing with the principal grape varieties, this is where you're actually going to find the bulk of the questions being asked as part of that level two exam. So a lot of attention needs to be paid to the varieties here. So what are the principal grape varieties that you cover at level two? Well, for black grapes, it's Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, Syrah or Shiraz, depending upon where in the world you are, and Pinot Noir. And then for the white grape varieties, we're looking at Chardonnay, Pinot Grigio or Pinot Gris, Riesling and Sauvignon Blanc. And for those eight principal grape varieties, there are a number of assessment criteria you need to be looking into as well under learning outcome three. Those assessment criteria are being able to describe the characteristics of those principal grape varieties, being able to describe how the environmental influences and grape growing options are going to impact the characteristics of those grapes. Being able to describe how the wine making options are going to impact on the various styles of wine produced by these different styles of grape. Describing how bottle aging is going to impact the grape varieties. Being able to describe the grape varieties from their specific geographical indicators. Being able to compare the styles and qualities of wines from various regions globally. And finally, being able to state regionally important labeling terms, which might indicate the style or the quality of wine made from those principal grapes. So as you can see, a lot to get through there. And as with other videos, we're gonna tackle each assessment criteria one by one with some example questions to give you a feel for what you might get asked as part of that exam. So let's jump straight into assessment criteria number one. This is all about describing the characteristics of the principal grape variety. So I won't go through those again, but what you do need to be able to talk about are the colors, acidities, aromas, flavors, and sugars leading to potential alcohol of each of those different varieties. So we've got our white grapes there. And then on our next slide, we've got our, our black grapes. So again, the difference between the white grapes and the black grapes is for the black grapes, you need to be able to talk about the tannin level in the wine. So when we talk about the basic characteristics of wine, we're talking about some of the aromas you might expect, as well as some of those all important characteristics when tasting the wine. What's it like on the palate? What's the acidity like? What's the tannin like? Is it medium, high, low? Those are the types of things you need to be thinking about under this assessment criteria. Let's take a look at some example questions then to get you comfortable with what to expect. So which of the following would you consider to be aroma characteristics of Pinot Noir? Would it be black plum and blueberry? Would it be raspberry and red cherry? Would it be lemon and gooseberry? Or would it be peach and pineapple? The way that this question is structured is very typical of WSET level two. I found when I was doing my exam that often I could discount a couple of these immediately and then really start to focus on those more appropriate types of answers. And the reason I say that is clearly two of the answers here are associated with white grapes and only two of them are associated with black grapes. So it's going to come down to what you've learned through the book about Pinot Noir. And you'll learn that raspberry and red cherry are considered aroma characteristics of Pinot Noir. Moving on to another example now. In a hot climate, what would display tropical fruit aromas such as pineapple or mango? Would it be Chardonnay, Riesling, Pinot Noir or Merlot? And again, in this example, there are a couple you can discount immediately because we associate pineapple and mango with white wine aromas. So then it comes down to whether or not you believe this one to be Chardonnay or Riesling. And we're talking about a hot climate here where you'll learn that Chardonnay is going to be displaying tropical type aromas in wine. Next up, we've got a question about what a particular grape is like on the palate. So how would you best describe the characteristics of Merlot? Would you say it has low tannin and high acidity, 
medium tannin and medium acidity, low tannin and low acidity, and high tannin and low acidity. And what the WSET syllabus does, and, and particularly within the workbooks that you get given, is it will give you this information pretty early on in the section about Merlot. So you'll understand that it's medium tannin and medium acidity, how we best describe those characteristics. And we'll have one more question under assessment criteria number one. That's describe the key characteristics of Cabernet Sauvignon. Would you say it's deeply colored with low tannin? thin-skinned with low tannin, deeply colored with high tannin, or thin-skinned with low acidity. Another example of a typical question you might get asked and the typical structure you can expect those questions to be in. And again, the book is gonna cover this, but in the case of Cabernet Sauvignon, we'd be talking about a grape that is deeply colored with high tannins. Now that we've been able to look at some of the basic characteristics of grapes under assessment criteria number one, let's move on to number two, where we're starting to describe how environmental influences and grape growing options are gonna impact the characteristics of those grapes. Now there is a little bit of crossover as we go through the assessment criteria here. We're gonna be looking at the climate, cool, moderate, warm. We might be looking at the harvest and how picking grapes early compares to picking grapes late. And actually that is something we covered under part one as well. And then we're also gonna be talking about the concentration of grape sugars, where we're going through extra ripe, noble rot, frozen grapes. And again, this is where you'll start to see crossover between learning outcomes, because in part one, learning outcome one, we talked a little bit about underripe, ripe and extra ripe. But of course, now we're applying it to those principal grape varieties. So start thinking about those eight varieties and what types of influences extra ripe, underripe, cool climate, hot climate might have in association with those grapes. So our first question here is all about associating specific aromas with a specific type of climate. So grass and asparagus aroma notes might indicate what? Is it a cool climate Merlot? Is it a hot climate Sauvignon Blanc? Is it a hot climate Pinot Noir? Or is it a cool climate Sauvignon Blanc? So this is where we're starting to apply what we might have learned previously on some of the other learning outcomes, but now we're specifically putting it to those eight principal grape varietals. In the case of grass and asparagus as an aroma, you would be associating that with cool climate Sauvignon Blanc. Now let's do another question along similar lines. So what aromas would you expect from a hot climate Cabernet Sauvignon? Would it be red cherry and strawberry, mango and papaya, lemon and green fruit, or blackcurrant and black cherry? Again here, it's easy to separate two answers out correctly from two wrong ones. We've got some white wine aromas and some red wine aromas here. But the key thing here is picking out the right ones for Cabernet Sauvignon, and that is going to be displaying blackcurrant and black cherry aromas. And let's go through another example of aromas with climate. So dark chocolate and sweet spice are aroma descriptors for what? Is it going to be a hot climate Shiraz, a cool climate Pinot Noir, a hot climate Chardonnay, or a cool climate Pinot Gris? Again, we've got that split black grape from white. So pick out which one's correct and then start to deduce from what you've learned, which is gonna be the correct answer to apply. Here, when we're talking about sweet spice and dark chocolate, we're gonna be thinking about a hot climate Shiraz, those styles from Australia in particular. Now let's have a think about how influences in the vineyard might actually affect one of the key principal grape varietals. So a climate that is too cool is going to result in what types of aromas and flavours for Pinot Noir? Are they going to be red cherry aromas? Are they going to be excessively vegetal? Are they going to be blackberry notes? Or could they be lime and peach aromas? And the thing here is we're using the phrase too cool, which might suggest that the grapes are actually under ripened. Now Pinot Noir, even in, in cool climates and something producers might go for, are sometimes kind of stalkier, greener types of notes. But of course, if that's too cool, it's gonna be excessively vegetal. And that's the correct answer here. So we're gonna move on from conditions in the vineyard and how that might affect the principal grapes to winemaker options in the winery and how that's gonna affect the grapes. So assessment criteria number three is being able to describe how winemaking options are gonna impact on the styles of wine produced from those principal grape varieties. You'll be thinking about the types of vessels that might be used, whether that be stainless steel, concrete, or oak. And if it is oak, you might be going through whether it's a small, large, 
barrel, whether it's new or old oak and the level of toastiness that that might produce. You'll be thinking about how malolactic conversion and lees aging impacts certain grapes in particular. And then finally, why we might blend grapes. What's the consistency, complexity and style? And again, some of this assessment criteria was covered under learning outcome two, but that was looking at grapes more broadly. We're now gonna be applying this one to specific grape styles. So let's jump straight into a question that's along those lines. What additional aromas might a Cabernet Sauvignon that has been oak aged take on? Would it be honey and nuts? Would it be red plum? Would it be vanilla and cedar or would it be black plum? So the key here is thinking about oak aged because some of these aromas might appear in Cabernet Sauvignon without any oak aging requirement, but what's that oak aging gonna add? The answer here is vanilla and cedar. Uh, those are the types of aromas you can expect to see. And then what type of aromas would you expect from a Chardonnay that has spent time on the lees? Would they be green fruit aromas, citrus fruit aromas, bready and yeasty aromas or coconut and vanilla. And again, you'd be thinking about, well, what is Lee's aging? What's the process of that? We did cover that off in part two, and we talked about how that would create richer textures uh, and a different flavor profile as part of that assessment. But here we're going into the specifics on the aromas where the correct answer would be bready and yeasty types of aromas. And finally, under assessment criteria number three, let's have a question about blending. In Bordeaux, Sauvignon Blanc is often blended with what? Is it Riesling, Semillon, Merlot or Syrah? And again, you'll be learning this through the book, through the course book that you get given, um, but you'll know that in Bordeaux, it's Sauvignon Blanc and it's blended with Semillon. All right, we're gonna move things along now to assessment criteria number four. And that's being able to describe how bottle aging is gonna impact on the various styles of wine produced from those principal grape varieties. So again, we covered this up as learning part of learning outcome two. But as I said, that was quite broad. Now we're gonna be looking at specific grapes. So for red wine, we're gonna be thinking about the color, tannin, aroma, and flavors. And for white wine, the all important color, aromas, and flavors. So what type of aromas might you expect with a mature oak aged Merlot? Would it be coffee and vanilla, mushroom and hay, bread and biscuit or strawberry? So what you need to recall in this one, of course, is what type of flavor characteristics and aroma characteristics might oak impart as opposed to some of the other winemaking options. When it comes to Merlot and oak aging on Merlot, you are more likely to expect coffee and vanilla types of aromas uh, from the choices that have been presented here. And which aged wine might display an aroma of petrol? Would it be Riesling, Chardonnay, Pinot Gris or Pinot Noir? Probably one of the easier questions that you might get asked, but it's certainly a level two type question because it's thinking about aged wines and the aromas that they give. But I think we're all very familiar with Riesling and it's very well documented petrol note in the aroma. So now moving on to assessment criteria number five. This is probably the most detailed one in terms of giving you information because what it's going to be teaching you are the styles and qualities of wines produced from those principal grape varieties in the specific geographical indicators. So there is a lot to go through here. Now, what you're looking at at level two are specific areas within the European Union and then specific areas from other Merlot producing countries. Not all, you don't cover all areas at level two, but you are going through a significant number. So for Merlot within the European Union, you'll be talking about the south of France for PGI production, and then for PDO production, a little bit more specific, regionally based, you'll be looking at Bordeaux, saint Emilion, and Pomerol. And then worldwide, you're gonna be looking at the US, Chile, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. And again, you'll be looking at specific regions within those countries and WSET level two is gonna be basing questions on just those regions that they're covering off. You wouldn't be getting a question about a region that isn't captured in the syllabus or that isn't captured as part of that specification of the course. So there you go, that's what Merlot is gonna be covering off and we'll go through the others, not in too much detail, but we'll go through them anyway. So Cabernet Sauvignon, as you can see, you're covering off Bordeaux specifically, as well as the south of France when it comes to the European Union. And then within other wine producing countries, we're looking at the USA again, 
Chile, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. So we've got a good blend of old world and new world. And there are, again, some specific regions within those countries that are covered off. You can see those there on the screen. For Syrah, Shiraz, we'll be looking at the Rhone in particular within France. And then more broadly, looking at it this globally, we'll be looking at Australia and certain regions within Australia. For Pinot Noir, we'll be talking about Burgundy, of course, when it comes to France. And then for the rest of the world, we've got the USA, Chile, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand, a very global grape covered off at level two there. For Chardonnay, we're gonna be, again, talking about Burgundy uh, and sp some specific regions within Burgundy. And then more broadly, it's the USA, Chile, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. So you can see a bit of a pattern here in terms of the countries that are being covered off. For Sauvignon Blanc, we are in the Loire Valley as well as Bordeaux. And then more broadly, the USA, Chile, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. For Pinot Grigio, Pinot Gris, uh, we look at the Veneto area within Italy as a broader area. And then when it comes to some more specifics, we've got France, we have Alsace, and then in Italy, we've got some examples there as well. And then finally, Riesling. Within France, we're looking at the Alsace, and then there are some regions in Germany we're gonna be looking at. And worldwide, we go to only to Australia, Clare Valley, and Eden Valley. So as you can see, that there is an awful lot to get through when it comes to the great varietals, especially these eight principal ones. And that really speaks to why there are so many questions, why the exam is weighted so much in favor of learning outcome three. The more weighted mean, meaning the more questions you're gonna get asked. So I have got some examples that I wanna go through. Obviously, I could spend days and days coming up with different examples here uh, when it comes to the eight varieties. So I've just come up with a few, of course, to give you a feel for what you're gonna get asked. So let's start off with this one here. Within the Cote d'Or, Wines from the best vineyards will be indicated by what on the label? Is it Grand Cru, Classico, Vin de France, or Bordeaux Superieur? And again, this is just getting you used to the principal grape varieties from the regions that they're gonna be grown. So we know that when it comes to uh, the Cote d'Or, that's in Burgundy, we'll be looking at Pinot Noir, and the labeling term that's used in this case is Grand Cru. The wines of Hermitage are made predominantly from what? Is it Merlot, Pinot Noir, Syrah, or Cabernet Sauvignon? So what you need to call back to here is, well, which grapes were based in Hermitage? Hermitage is part of the Northern Rhone. So you'll remember as we were going through those principal varieties that it was Syrah that was focusing specifically on the Northern Rhone. That of course is the right answer here. Which of the following is likely to have medium sweetness? Is it going to be a Moselle Riesling Spätlaser? Is it going to be a Chablis? Is it going to be a Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc? Or is it going to be a Fino Sherry? And here again, we're thinking about the types of wines that the grapes produce, and then where are those wines produced? You will cover off Riesling as making dry styles as well as sweet styles. And therefore, in this case, it's the Moselle that's correct. Moselle Riesling Spätlaser. Spätlaser meaning late harvest. Next question, pale lemon with high acidity and green fruit aromas would describe what? Is it a Cote Rôti? Is it a Chablis? Is it a Hunter Valley Chardonnay? Or is it a Barolo? I think this is a really good example of quite a trickier question at level two, but something you will get. You aren't given a particular grape here, so you're having to think about the various regions that are covered as part of this answer and the grapes that are grown in those regions. When you look at this, um, you can discount a couple immediately. And I say that because when we're thinking about pale lemon with green fruit aromas, we're thinking about a white wine. So we can get rid of our Cote Rotti, which would be Syrah, and our Barolo, which would be Nebbiolo. So we're really only left with a couple of options here. And we've got a warmer climate versus a cooler climate here. And Chablis is the cooler climate, and that is the correct answer. We would be associating pale lemon, high acidity, and green fruit aromas with a cooler climate. Next up then, the classic region for Pinot Gris is where? Is it Stellenbosch? Is it the Loire Valley? Is it Alsace? Or is it Kunawara? And this goes back to the cards I was showing earlier. You know, the Pinot Grigio, Pinot Gris card had some specific areas within the European Union where this was grown. And because there weren't any other regions of the world as part of the Pinot Grigio card, 
We know that we can discount Stellenbosch and Kunawara straight away, which just leaves the Loire and Alsace. And Pinot Gris is a class in Alsace. So which of the following region produces inexpensive wines made from Cabernet Sauvignon? Is it Chianti? Is it the Western Cape in South Africa? Is it Pauillac or is it Alsace? Again, really typical example of something you might expect to get. And the reason for that is your level two workbook will take you through premium versus bulk produced. So there's a couple we can discount here again. The Alsace and Chianti are not known for their Cabernet Sauvignons. Pauillac in Bordeaux is known for expensive wines, so that only really leaves one option, that's the Western Cape in South Africa. Now assessment criteria six, for me, covers a lot of what you've gone over in assessment criteria five. You need to be able to compare the styles and qualities of wines from the principal grape varieties within specific regions. Now, I actually feel we've covered a lot of that off with the previous questions. And assessment criteria six doesn't actually have any sub criteria to it. So we are gonna move along to criteria number seven. And that is being able to state the meaning of regionally important labeling terms, which might indicate the style and quality of wines made from those principal grape varieties. So we've got some examples of what you might find here. In Burgundy, we have Premier Cru and Grand Cru. In Bordeaux, we have just the labeling saying Bordeaux, it can then go on to say Bordeaux Superior, Cru Bourgeois, or Grand Cru Classe. In Alsace, we use the term Grand Cru. And then in Germany, we're gonna be going through some specific indicators of the types of wine that they produce. Um, I'm gonna pick out a couple here. So, so Cabernet, Spätlaser, Auslaser, Beer and Auslaser are labeled as such dependent on the uh, must weight, the sugars in the wine. And then you've got a couple of other phrases there, trocken and help trocken. So let's look at a couple of questions based on labeling. Which of the following is a labeling term in Alsace? Is it Premier Cru, Cru Alsace, Alsace Superior or Grand Cru? And you'll recall from that previous slide we just had a look at now that when it comes to labeling in Alsace, there's only actually one you need to remember and that is Grand Cru. And then trocken on a wine label indicates what? Is it that the wine is sweet? that the wine is dry, that the wine is three years old, or that the wine is barrel age. So you don't necessarily need to know German uh, in order to be able to uh, answer this one, because of course you do learn the label terminology as you go through this. But for those of you who aren't sure, trocken means dry. It would mean the wine is dry. That's everything that's covered off as part of learning outcome number three. It's where the bulk of your WSCT coursework is going to be spent, understanding those eight varietals and being able to answer a number of questions about the styles, the regions, the winemaking options. It is indeed a very in-depth look at those styles. And that's where, as I say, a lot of the questions are based. Don't forget to check out the other videos in this particular series. But for now, I'm the Grape Explorer. See you again soon. Cheers.